Hello and welcome back to the latest Liverpool Echo Blood Red podcast. I'm Matt Addison with Paul Gorse, Theo Squires and Kiefer McDonald as we talk Wolves, Manchester United and Roberto Firmino. Gorsi, I'll come to you first. We'll start with Roberto Firmino's future. Sky Germany broke it this morning that Firmino has decided to leave Liverpool. I know you've looked into this as well, obviously coming to the end of his contract, but it does seem like a decision has been made on that. Are you of the opinion that that's the right decision? And do you want to talk us through what you know so far? Yeah, so it looks like Firmino is going to call time on his Liverpool career at the end of the season. We know his contract's up. Um, being able to speak to clubs outside of England since the start of January, hasn't he? And, and Klopp said at least at least three or four times now that um, he wanted to keep Firmino and talks were ongoing and, and all that kind of stuff. And Firmino was quoted in the official club magazine uh, a few weeks back now saying that he, he wanted to stay. And OK, fair enough, you can maybe say that, you know, speaking to the official club magazine is, you know, he's hardly going to go on the record and say, I want to get off. But... Um, that for me was enough of a declaration to think that maybe there's something in the pipeline and, and he'll be able to stay on because he's only 31. Um, but no, uh, he has decided to seek a fresh challenge. Uh, it was a bit of an interesting one because it was Florian uh, Plettenberg, wasn't it? He broke the news from Sky Germany this morning, but in the kind of detail of the tweets, it was saying that Firmino had informed them this morning before training. Uh, I'm, I was at the accident centre meeting the over there this morning for at half nine for Pops press conference and training isn't until at some point this afternoon and the players weren't there. The players weren't, you know, told to show up until about 11, I should think. So that was a, initially made me sceptical, to be honest. I was thinking, well, when's this conversation taking place in person? Um, because it was all very detailed about how Klopp, you know, for me, I was desperate to tell him in person and he's already told him before training and whatever. So I was a little bit sceptical about that, but then obviously checked it out speaking to a couple of people and whatever it does it has turned out that um while some of the details are maybe not quite as they were the, the main gist of it is that Firmino has you know told the manager at some stage that he, don't, he wants to move on uh, he put a little bit of an interesting thing on Instagram last night which you know was neither here nor there out of context but um, in context, it you know it does kind of reveal a lot. It's a um, it's kind of a biblical quote, and I've got it here. It says, uh, "For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not feel sorrow, for the joy of our Lord is your strength." <laughs> and it's kind of for me, you know, clapping the fans. Uh, don't know what game it's from, but you know when you see that, you know at the time you probably just think, you know, for me, you know, obviously very uh, very religious, and uh, it's just one of those things you put on social media. But maybe. Uh, Putting two and two together does actually make forward at this point that perhaps, you know, he, he's put that on social media as a kind of indicator that he's accepted that his time is up and he's looking for a new challenge. Um, still only 31, but, you know, I'm sure we'll come on to it shortly. Uh, he'll leave us an absolute legend, won't he? I think maybe Liverpool could have got another season out of him, given that it doesn't look like they're going to be looking to prioritise a replacement. But he's a high earner, um, and I suppose, you know, a lot of fans talk about that and, you know, we're not accountants. I'm not interested in wages whatsoever. But if it does mean that it can be reinvested into a, a player in coming into the squad, then I suppose that that is, is one positive aspect. But massively uh, shame to see that he's going to be moving on and it'll be done with a heavy heart, I'm sure, when, when he does finally move on at the end of the season. Yeah, Theo, it, it does feel like one of those that will be a tough goodbye. We've seen a couple of, of those in recent seasons. Obviously, Sadio Mane last season, Gini Wijnaldum has left as well, similar to Firmino at, at the end of, of his contract. I mean, to me, it, it does feel like the right time for him to move on, I have to say. He will be 32 the first few weeks of next season. He's missed a fair bit of football through injury the last sort of 18 months or so in particular. But what are your thoughts on it? Do you think it's the right time or would you have possibly looked at to keep him for a little bit longer? Uh, I think it's the right time, really. It's one where first half of the season he was scoring a lot of goals when Liverpool weren't necessarily playing well, and he was getting games. Like I think he started ten in a row or eleven in a row or something before the World Cup. But when you look at it, that's because of the injuries elsewhere. And they've signed Gakpo, they've signed Jota, they've signed Nunes, they've signed Diaz. That's like 180 million pounds worth of talent there to revamp the attack and to basically replace him in this long game. And it's one where you had him in the front three with Mane and Salah. 
everything went around Firmino. He was who you built the Liverpool team around. But now it feels like if you want him in your team, you're having to move others around to accommodate him because he doesn't have the pace of others. He's not as versatile as the others. And they just offer that little bit more, shall we say. Like I don't want to be too critical of him because he is a Liverpool legend and he has always uh, made an impact. He just doesn't have the same attributes that these players are. And Liverpool are going in this direction where it's more pace, it's more the power, and it's getting those goals. And while they've got Firmino, who's been so effective as the false nine, dropping deep, getting assists, scoring so many goals all the time, they've maybe tried to or sign Nunes. That was a different sign of the number nine they're going to have. Now putting Gakpo in that role, he's basically a taller, quicker version. So it is moving in a slightly different direction. And it's one where with his goal return dwindling over the last couple of years, if you've got all your forwards fully fit, Roberto Firmino is not the first one you turn to off the bench. If you've got a full collection of players and all over the squad, he's potentially even someone you risk leaving off the bench altogether and doesn't make the squad, depending on who else is available. And it's one where you, you don't want to see him reduced to that because he is the player that scored the goal that saw Liverpool crowned world champions for the first time in their history, like the one trophy they hadn't ever won. Because of Roberto Firmino, Liverpool have that to their name. Uh, he's won Premier League, he's won Champions League, he's won every honour going. They will always sing about him long after he's gone. And hopefully when he hangs up his boots, we'll see him come back for a few of these Legends games because that's what he is, a Liverpool legend. But having last couple of seasons under his belt where he's not played as much, the game time's only going to limit further. Um, I've just done a piece now and you think when when Steven Gerrard left, he said it's because he was on the bench against Real Madrid at the Bernabeu. Now, when Liverpool go to the Bernabeu, Firmino's probably going to be on the bench there. But there are other games this season when you're thinking maybe that comes into his mind. Like he comes back from injury the same time as Diogo Jota, but it's Jota who's in the start in 11 despite being out for longer. It's Firmino who's on the bench waiting for the opportunity. He sees Gakpo come on ahead of him against Wolves and he only comes on the 89th minute. You know Diaz is coming back in the next few weeks if they're lucky. Uh, that game time isn't going to increase unless there are injuries. Go and be a starter as well um, for Firmino. Maybe somewhere where it's not quite as fast-paced so he can play more games, get that goal count high again. Uh, he's a Liverpool legend. Hopefully, wherever he goes next, he'll have a good four or five years and he can be a legend there as well. Yeah, it'll certainly be interesting to see where he ends up. But I do think there were a couple of, of clues really key for in the fact that he was maybe going to move on. One is the fact that it came this late in the season and there's only three or four months left and we hadn't really heard anything. It's very, very rare that a player signs an extension at this point. And obviously the same goes for, for Cater and, and Oxley chamberlain and others. But the other one as well is that Cody Gakpo has obviously come in and clearly has played a, a very similar sort of role, as Theo says, not entirely the same. It's a bit of a, an evolved version of what Roberto Firmino did for Liverpool. But it does kind of feel like they've been gearing up for this and it, it won't have maybe come as a surprise to Liverpool, even if it has to Liverpool fans. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that January 1st date is, is pretty key when you get into the kind of last year of a player's contract, then obviously when you reach that that kind of halfway mark of the season, they can, you know, start negotiating with, with size abroad. You know, you feel like the writing is on the wall. Maybe, you know, exceptional cases like James Milner, as, as we saw kind of last season and again this season, where you think, you know, there's probably still a chance that they'll sign. But I think when you look at, you know, Naby Keita, Oxley chamberlain and, and obviously Firmino prior to today, you think, you know, I think while the signs were there and as, as Gorsi says, you know, there was comments made and in, in, in interviews and stuff where, you know, from both Klopp and, and Firmino, where it did look like he was going to stay. I don't think it's, as you say, Matt, I don't think it's a massive surprise to anyone. And, and I think it is probably the, the right time as well. Um, you know, I think I think over the last 18 months, um, you know, how, how kind of Liverpool have kind of brought the, the age group down of, of this the forward line, obviously. That that fame trio of Mane, Firmino and Salah, obviously Salah will be the only one now who's, who's going to remain at the club. Um, but obviously, you've got Darwin Nunes, 23, Diaz, I think, what, 25, 26. You've got Diogo Jota, who's, what, 25. So, you know, slowly but surely, Liverpool have kind of brought that age down and kind of addressed that that kind of that area within the squad. And and I think, to be fair, without sitting on the fence, I think, whilst it is the right time, I think, you know, if they had given him another year, um, I think certainly prior to the World Cup, I don't think anyone would have had any, any complaints, really, I think. You know, he, as Theo said, he scored a lot of goals. Um, maybe not playing at his, his best, but he was scoring goals. And and you know, there were, there were signs that he could still have an impact at, at this level. But I think when you when you kind of get down to it and, and kind of the nitty gritty of it, I think it, it probably works for all parties. And and as you say, with I wonder if you know, the, the kind of the, the the move for Gappa, which you know, I don't think anyone expected mid season. Obviously, with with the the injuries for Mino picked up, I wonder if that maybe is you know 
change the kind of the, the landscape and, and maybe Firmino's feelings as as you know he's not going to play as much football as he, he probably thought between now and the end of the season and then he's, he's maybe had a taste and thought you know actually heading into my 30s I, I would maybe like one final payday or you know to, to kind of be a, a prominent figure of a starting 11 again and, and to be honest with the service he's given Liverpool since since 2015 I don't think anyone can begrudge him you know for that decision which, whichever one it is but yeah I think it is a shame because you, you know all these players who we've you know certainly people of my age have, have grown fond of you know for kind of the first kind of successful Liverpool side of their lifetime and as you say, Juan Adam was the first, wasn't he? Then obviously we had we had Mane, and and, and now obviously Firmino's you know going to be the latest one. And I suppose the, the, the pleasing element of it is is unlike Mane, he'll he'll have a, a real send off at Anfield. And 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 to be fair, Juan Adam obviously didn't get it as well, did he? Because you know there was only a, a reduced capacity at Anfield on that on that final day against Crystal Palace. So you know I think that's only the, probably the silver lining in all of this. At least now people know in advance, and they can kind of give him the, the send off that his, his Liverpool career has, has truly merited. It's got um, similarities to those two we just mentioned there as well, isn't it? Like the fact that they've essentially brought in the replacement before the player moves on. Right? You think they got a year of Thiago and Gini and Alden together when Thiago was essentially taking his place in the squad. You got uh, six months of Diaz being groomed as Mane's replacement as he was being modelled as that that striker for six months. And now we're going to get six months of Gakpo alongside Firmino before Firmino moves on. But as uh, a Gorst, you mentioned about getting the wages off the wage bill. It's, well, think of what Liverpool can do with that. We saw the accounts come out uh, last month and that wage bill is getting higher and higher. So that'll make a dent in that. And if you get a new signing coming in off the back of that, a marquee signing, um, that's one fittingly one final assist, isn't it, from Roberto Firmino. When he, when he joined Liverpool, it was the same summer Steven Gerrard left. So like it's not a direct passing of the baton from legend to legend, but if Firmino can... His departure opens the door for the next Liverpool legend to come in. I think Jurgen Klopp can be very happy with that. Yeah, I read your piece before, Gorsty, uh, around the, the possibility of Roberto Firmino being replaced in the summer. The priorities, as you mentioned before, obviously lying elsewhere. The midfield is is a big one. I, I wonder, you know, is is that the, the right thing? Do you think would would you look to replace Roberto Firmino in the summer? Because I think it obviously would be would be nice to, to bring him in but then you do think there is a, a long to-do list of, of other bits around the squad that they're going to have to do as well yeah i think that's spot on i think that was one of the reasons why i was leaning towards maybe a little year extension because he's obviously a very useful player to, to have around there's no busted flush he's still only 31 as you say he's not 32 um well actually me and him share the same birthday which is a bit, a bit mad considering i'll be four years older than him when he when he uh, turns 32 crazy um so I, I, you know, seeing him leave is I, I just can't see Liverpool. I couldn't see Liverpool, you know, making a a move to bring in a replacement beforehand. And then when I kind of started asking around about it, the, the belief was that Liverpool are going to be looking to target other areas anyway. Um, so it's essentially, you know, I'd, I'd rather have him in the squad than not. If 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 that's if they're the options and and they seem to be. That they are the only two options for Liverpool at the moment. So, you know, I can see why, from a wage bill point of view, he was a, he was a high earner, and they were probably reluctant to have someone who was going to be way down the pecking order when everyone's fit and ready to go on such a high wage. But ultimately, you know, that's of no concern to supporters, is it? Unless you do use that wage elsewhere, um, that will be the bit the big thing now. I guess you know if, if they're looking to bring in. Two, three, four, twelve, thirteen. However many midfielders you think Liverpool need this summer, I suppose Firmino being freed from the wage bill will be um, useful for bringing players in. Because as we've seen with the accounts, as Theo mentions, you know that was only on Tuesday, wasn't it? I can't believe that was this week. That does feel like it was ages away now. Um, Liverpool still have got one of the highest wage bills in football, and for all the spending or, or lack of spending as some supporters would see it and um, you know that wage bill is there and not really shrinking them very uh you know incentivized that we're led to believe in terms of you know they will pay a lot more for things that they win so when you're winning you know when you get into the champions league final and you get 92 premier league points and you and you win both domestic cups that's you know one one of the reasons why it does lean on the kind of high side but as I say, if, if Firmino is to leave and there isn't going to be a replacement, then that kind of wage packet can't just be stashed away and held on the club's books. I think they've got to reinvest that 
into some of the, uh, the the big name players you've been looking at for the summer? I suppose, Theo, in terms of trying to replace him, there are maybe a couple of, of younger options. We've not seen loads of, of Fabio Cavallio, for example. He could be one that maybe his role grows next season. You think Harvey Elliott, maybe could he become another forward option? Maybe maybe that's the way that Liverpool go about this rather than bringing in somebody else. Maybe those options already exist within Jurgen Klopp's squad. Yeah, I think that's something that Liverpool will consider. There have also been reports that Ben Doak's supposed to get more of a look in next year that already see him as a first team player in the making and when you look at Liverpool's attacking options as I already said Mino's not versatile he plays down the middle and that's pretty much about it whereas all the others can play in at least two positions if not across all three so he'd have been essentially what the fourth choice central attacking option when you've still got Gakpo can play on the left Nunes can play on the left Jota can do all three Diaz can do both flanks Salah can go down the middle too and um, you look at the youngsters the youngsters are the ones you maybe see playing more on the right-hand side, like Katie Gordon's coming back from injury. I know we've been saying this for pretty much nine, ten months now, but he is coming back from injury. Hopefully we'll see him in action for the 21s at least before the end of the season. And you've got some other talented youngsters down at the academy who are doing bits this year as well. Uh, quite a few of them getting goals. And Elliot Carvalho, you think, well, Elliot, he's looked good in midfield, I think, against Wolves. But in the, since the turn of the year, he has looked better when he's been used in that front three. Carvalho, you'd imagine after a season bedding in, we'll see a bit more of him next year. He was someone who he was groomed, I suppose, as this potential Firmino replacement, as like a false nine sort of thing. He's yet to really find his true role at Liverpool. But there are a lot of players there who can cover it. And realistically, you don't want to actually need them that much. Like If Liverpool end up in the Europa League or the Europa Conference League, by all means, go to Malta or Cyprus or whatever and do a front three of uh, Carvalho, Elliot and Doak or something like that. But if they're in the Champions League and going on all fronts, you still you want to see the main four or five competing for these places. So realistically, they don't necessarily need someone there to take a place unless there are injuries. But Salah's got a really good injury record. You're hoping Diaz and Jota, this is just a, a one-year thing, they can shake that off. And then Gakpo and Nunes couple of knocks here and there maybe but they can be players you can rely on in the future as well just before we move on then Kiefer is there a is there a favorite Roberto Firmino moment that you can bring us what what what's your sort of best bits from him I, for me personally I think that turn against Villarreal kind of uh, sums up what he was about but there's certainly a lot more to pick from as well how long have we got um, <laughs> I, think, I think personally uh, my favorite one was um, after we beat Bayern at the Allianz in in March 2019 and it was really good the way they did it over over in, in Germany, as in like, you know, you, there was no segregation, like held back after the game kind of thing. It was kind of everyone just, you know, on their own accord could make it out of the ground where, you know, usually you'd be held in, in a lock-in for 45 minutes or so. And, and by the time kind of everyone had, had kind of come out of the away end, they just kind of congregated outside the stadium. And, and for must, must have been about 20 minutes, half an hour, everyone was just there chanting the Firmino song that had kind of got going in, in Paris uh, earlier that season. So best in the world, is, is, his name is Roberto Firmino. And it was just going on for like 20, 25 minutes. Liverpool had obviously just put their, their place in the, in the quarterfinals of the Champions League and obviously kind of had that that scratch of, of what happened in Kiev and there was all this kind of momentum building. And that was just a real moment of like, obviously I know he didn't score that game. It was obviously Mane who stole the show, but that was, that was one where it was like, you know, I mean, I saw someone tweet earlier that that first line of the, First line of his song just kind of says everything about him, you know, how, how loved he is and how he how adored. But in terms of individual moments, I think I think my favourite goal off the top of my head is it's a bit of a rogue shout, but it's his one at Stoke in uh, 2017. Um, purely just, I mean, I think Coutinho equalised into just a, a few minutes beforehand. It was, I think it was a really young side they played that day. I think Ben Woodburn played and and a few other players kind of of, of that kind of ilk and and. Uh, I think Liverpool go, go, go down and, and then Coutinho gets one just after half time. And then there's the, the Pyros going off just, just uh, in, in front of the goal. And the ball drops to Firmino and he hits it on the, on the volley and, and then takes his shirt off. And then for me, that was, that's always been my favourite Roberto Firmino goal. But I mean, there's so many other moments. And, and you know, and don't again, go into them, Kiva. We've still got a week with no <laughs> Fulham game and then the international break. We'll do our Firmino <laughs> podcast for them. But no, in terms, I know he hasn't scored in a final. I think everyone's kind of always said, you know, he, he kind of deserved that crowning moment. But I think in terms of, you know, not to discredit Salah or Mane, because obviously, you know, they're both excellent, excellent players in, in their own kind of way. And obviously being, being great servants during the time, time at the club, I think, you know, Firmino is obviously highly regarded as kind of the glue that kept that front three together. And I think it's fair to say if, if you know, 
you took him out of that equation, would Liverpool have had the same success? And again, not to discredit the work of Salah, Mane and all the others, but I would I would highly doubt that Liverpool have been successful and, and you know, he's such a selfless player, such a, such a brilliant player. So, yeah, it will be a sad moment, but like I say, hopefully he can get the, the send-off he deserves. Like Dan Kay used to say, he's the straw that mixes the drink, isn't he? Um, I've, I've got a way in with a little bit of Firmino favourite moments so I'm not just letting, letting Kiefer have that one to himself <laughs> uh, off the top of my head probably is winning goal in the uh, Club World Cup because you know that competition is weirdly kind of sneered at in England maybe that's a bit of a kind of insight into the insular view we have generally in this country I don't know but um, it's massive isn't it the, the Club World Cup outside of certainly outside of Europe outside of the Champions League and, and particularly in South America. So for him to get the win in that one and Liverpool to win it for the first ever time in a history was probably, um, you know, certainly one of the ones that comes to the top, top of my head anyway when I think of Firmino. Uh, unbelievable, modern day great, Anfield legend. Everything you want to say about him. And, and I think Michael Edwards actually summed it up best when he said in this kind of open letter when it came out that he was leaving, you know, where uh, people always ask me who my favourite player is and I don't like to comment, but there's a reason my dog's called Bobby. Yeah, I think that sums it up pretty much perfectly, doesn't it? Probably, I think, one of one of my favourite players. It's impossible to pick a, a favourite player of, of the modern era, isn't it? There's so many, so many greats, but I think he does kind of epitomise what Jurgen Klopp's team has all been about. Uh, we will move on to Manchester United. I will let you have your say, Theo, as well. Uh, both of the of the others have picked out their, uh, their favourite Firmino moment. Do you want to jump in quickly with one of yours as well? No, I'm saving mine for the international break and for <laughs> when that Fulham game doesn't happen. We can do a full podcast on Bobby then. I'm sure we will. All right, keep your powder dry then. I'll come to you instead on Manchester United because if you'd have said to me that about a month ago, Liverpool would go four league games without conceding a goal, they'd win three and they'd draw one of those. I think I would certainly have taken that heading into this one. It does feel a little bit different, doesn't it, compared to to a few games ago. Obviously, this will be a bigger test. There's been Real Madrid in there as well. But what do you reckon heading into to the weekend? Are you fairly confident that Liverpool can do something or certainly a lot more confident, I would imagine, than you were a few weeks ago? Probably more confident than I was a few days ago, to be honest, never mind a few weeks. Um, having Canate back in that back four was huge in midweek because it just felt a lot more comfortable for Liverpool. Gorsty and I no, were there at Anfield. And for, it's been a rare feeling this season, but it was one where it wasn't, oh, are Liverpool going to score are they going to concede a sloppy first goal? It was, when are they going to score? Like the crowd was reared it behind them. And they just had that self-belief back, that confidence back. And it's like, hello, this is what Liverpool won titles on, that that attitude of, it doesn't matter what minute they score in, this goal is coming, this victory is coming. And Klopp had said in his pre-match press conference before that, that clean sheets are nice because it means you only need to win by like one goal, a couple of goals. You're just hoping that with Canate back in that back four, there's a bit more solidity there. And I think we went through it after the game with uh, me and Pat, and it's just like so many players played well. It, was like, it wasn't a vintage performance from Liverpool by any means, but like you can pick out Simakas' superb assist for the second goal. Uh, Nunes, just, he was so unlucky that his goal was chalked off. Jota's run for the disallowed goal. Salah's involved. Trent was back to his best. Fabinho was superb. Two teenagers in midfield alongside him, just doing the business as well. Van Dijk, much more like it from him as well. It's like, this is what you want to see from Liverpool. And I think of putting a few more performances like that between now and the end of the season. You fancy them to go the distance in the top four chase. But now it's the biggest test they've had to this side. Like We saw how, I suppose, the Real Madrid team um, the result damaged confidence a little bit against Crystal Palace. You're hoping that they can completely get out of the system, be confident and leave a marker on Manchester United and damage their momentum. Like I keep going saying they're going for a, a quadruple. No, you're not, boys. You're not winning that Premier League title. You're getting whatever you called our Mickey Mouse treble all those years ago at absolute best. Uh, so stop their winning run in its tracks and get yourself a bit close to the top four. That would be the perfect day for Liverpool. But you need them to build on walls. The signs are there, but it's slow progress. And that's what Klopp said earlier this season as well. It's just those small steps and keep putting a few of them together. You might have a, a happy ending come May. I think, obviously, it is that sort of um, solidity that we've seen a bit more from Liverpool recently. Fabinho, Jurgen Klopp was talking about earlier. Van Dijk was was excellent. Canate yeah. as well. It, it kind of feels like when you've got a solid base, Liverpool have got so many good attackers that they probably will score at some point. But keep a clean sheet first and, and see where you go from there. Yeah, it, it's no surprise to me that Liverpool have kept um, 
three clean sheets with Van Dijk back in the team. Obviously, they kept one against Everton when he was on the bench, but you know, we had with respect to him, it was just Ellis Sims kind of up front, very isolated, wasn't it? It was quite comfortable for Liverpool from that perspective. But um, just having Van Dijk back in the back on the team is, is huge. Um, he, he set such remarkably high standards that when he's not at those levels, people almost dismiss him and, and try to pretend that he's not he's still one of the absolute very best centre-backs in, in world football. And, and he is, you know, undoubtedly. So just, just having him back on the team has been huge. And, and I thought he was really good the other night. And if he stays fit, uh, Liverpool have got a great chance of, of, as you say, just kind of, if they're not absolutely paired enough front, they'll still maybe create enough to, to nick a goal here or there and, and come away on the right side of the results. So it was almost a bit of a throwback on Wednesday night to, to the, the year Liverpool in the league. Very, you know, minimal fuss, uh, just got the job done, didn't absolutely battle walls, but just did enough to come away with a routine, ordinary, run of the mill, mundane, however you want to describe it. Um, but it was quite welcome in the fact that Liverpool just haven't been able to do that at all all season. So for it to happen, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, Liverpool will take that and they'll move on and three more points in the bag and, and they look ahead to more, you know, high profile, glamorous fixtures on the horizon like Sunday. So I think just having Van Dijk back in there is huge. And then Canate provides another stable kind of basis to build on, doesn't he? Um, because Mata Gomez is just, you know, horribly out of form. Um, so as long as Canate can stay fit and, and him and Van Dijk at the back, that allows the fullbacks to push on and, and create havoc. Uh, and Fabinho was a lot better as well, wasn't he? It was probably his best game of the season. So I think if Liverpool can keep that kind of triangle fit and in form for the rest of the season, then everything else will just build around it. Uh, and I actually think now that Liverpool will will get in the top four. I think there's still enough games left for them to turn around. I think they've proven in recent years that they can go and go on a bit of a run when um, when they absolutely need to. You know, the business end of the season, the other teams around them haven't proven that. Newcastle, an unknown quantity, I think they might start to, to slide down the table. I've only people won since, since January. Uh, Tottenham, you know, have become kind of synonymous with, with collapses, haven't they? So we'll see if they're able to, to withstand the, the next dozen games. Just sort of come to Anfield, of course. So um, after a rocky, certainly rocky start 2023 Liverpool just emerging out of it at maybe a really good time yeah still plenty of, of matches left to, to pick up those points but just in terms of, of Sunday Kiefer I mean a bit like Theo said before I'm not entirely convinced by Manchester United there's been a lot of talk of trophies and all the rest of it I think it's quite easily forgotten some of the uh, the ties that they got to get themselves to Wembley I know they obviously had to, to beat Newcastle, but it was a, a fairly straightforward route, I would suggest, to, to get to that point in the competition. But is this a, a bit of a chance to, to slow them down and sort of make it a bit of a point, really, do you think, for Liverpool? Or is that not necessarily important? Is it just a case of trying to get the three points for themselves? It's a really weird situation, isn't it? And I think Klopp's press conference this morning probably summed it up. I, I think I could only probably count a handful of times during Klopp's time at Liverpool that it feels like Liverpool have gone in, or sorry, United have come to Anfield as is kind of the favourites, certainly from from you know people away from the kind of Liverpool sphere. I think, but I, I think as we've said many times this season, you know these kind of big games. Obviously, the most recent one was was probably Chelsea, where we said you know if you can get a good result here, get it at home, and and can kind of maybe you know turn a corner, so to speak. But obviously that that wasn't the case. But it feels like now, as kind of the, the lads have said, that the foundations have been set in a very similar to way as, as it was two years ago, where you know they had a bit of a, a rocky kind of spring, but. You know they they kind of got some personnel back and and kind of Fabinho found found his form in midfield again after after playing in defence for a bit and they kind of kept those clean sheets and and obviously got the the Champions League place in, in that season and it kind of feels you know very similar a very similar situation in in that season again is you know teams weren't able to kind of um, make the most of Liverpool's kind of slump if you want to call it that and and you know especially now. It's weird because we're in March and there's still 14, 15 games left of the season when normally you're probably looking at, you know, 10 or 12, if, if that. So I think that certainly helps Liverpool. And and in terms of United, it's a weird one. It feels like, I mean, people always say, like, I know, like last season and that, the likes of Gary Neville and Roy Keane have said, you know, they're, they're a million miles away from City, you know, the five, six years from away from Liverpool as well. I mean, it just kind of shows that you're never too far away from, you know, returning to the top, so to speak. So, you know, when you kind of hear... This kind of hyperbial assessments of Liverpool's season, 
Well, you, well, you think United have had, you know, two decent transfer windows and, and to be fair, you know, one really decent signing in Casemiro and that's really transformed the kind of the attitude at the club and, and kind of the mentality there. And, and obviously Ten Hag, you know, deserves his praises because I think he has done a good job. But as you say, you know, I don't think, I don't think they've set the world alight as, as, as much as kind of people, you know, put it this way, if they lose at Anfield on, on Sunday, well, it wouldn't be a shock. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a shock if Liverpool beat them because they still think Liverpool have enough quality, um, you know, to, to raise their game. And I think when Liverpool are on, you know, Liverpool are on song in, in kind of how they were against City earlier in the season where they're really disciplined at the back and, and, and clinical in attack, you know, they, 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 should, they should be able to, you know, have enough to, to kind of better United. But I suppose obviously goes with that is, is the form of Marcus Rashford and it's obviously a very good feel, a feel-good story for kind of everyone, isn't it? In terms of what he's done over the last couple of years and I think everyone, you know, likes to see him do do well. I think even Jürgen Klopp mentioned, mentioned that this morning. Um but yeah, I don't. I certainly don't. Think, I certainly don't fear Liverpool losing this one. I mean, you, you know, this is this is the, the ability to come back and bite me. But I, I still think that they have enough there. And and you know, there's there's certain kind of uh, d- decisions that you know. I think I think the right side of midfield, who plays there, I think is, is going to be key, especially with you know Rashford up against Trent. I think that's you know really key. And obviously, we'll get onto team selections later. But I think it, it could be one for you know for Henderson to to kind of come back in and, and start that one. But. Yeah, I, I, I do fancy Liverpool. I just, I just think we, you know, obviously we had the game against City earlier in the year, and but I think Anfield has been crying out for a big performance. I know we got the the first half against or the first twenty minutes against Real Madrid, but it feels like there really needs to be like a, a big Anfield statement, you know, this year, and, and maybe this is the one. And I think, you know, as as as, as good as United have been, it might kind of, as you say, slow them down and take a bit of momentum out of, of what they're doing and, and the so called quadruple chase that they're, they're supposedly on at the moment. Yeah, it certainly does feel like a big occasion. Marcus Rashford, the, the big danger man, Gorsi. I know you've been speaking to, to Trent Alexander-Arnold this week. I'm sure it'll be a, a big, big game for, for him, I think, if, if Liverpool are to keep Marcus Rashford quiet. And it will be a, have to be a, a big performance that, that comes from Trent. Yeah, it will. But I, but I think maybe uh, the best way of keeping him quiet is for Liverpool to, to dominate the ball and, and for Trent to do, to do his best work in, in United's half. Um, 1v1, it'll be very difficult to stop Rashford. You know, I think most fullbacks would, would struggle to do that. He's one of the, the form players of Europe. Um, certainly this calendar year or since the World Cup ended. Um, so he'll need some help from Ibu Kanate on that side of the pitch, I think. But I think, you know, you know, whenever Klopp's asked specifically about, about danger men for the other team, he always kind of comes back to to the point of if they deny them the supply line and, and Liverpool keep the ball, then the player by extension is, is going to have a quiet game. So I think that'll be Liverpool's way of, of going about it. I don't think they're going to make any special reservations for Rashford in terms of you know telling Alexander Arnold to, to sit on the halfway line and, and not go over it. I think they'll just encourage them to play the, the game as as normal as possible. Um I think Liverpool are in a, a much stronger position for this game than they were at the start of the season in August when they'd they'd struggle to get going in, in the early couple of weeks. Um so I think you know it's that's going to be a fascinating battle, but you know similarly uh, for all the talk of, of Marcus Rashford, you know instilling fear into defenders, you know Mohamed Salah, Daniel the is going to do the exact same with with whoever's a left back for United. Um, I thought it was interesting actually that uh, in the Carabao Cup final, Ten Hag brought off Diogo Dalla, didn't he, for um, Adam Wan Bissaka at half time. I think that was the tactical change because Sam Maximum was was basically getting a free free run and causing all kinds of havoc. So it'll be interesting to see what what right back he goes with actually because obviously down Liverpool's left you're expecting Darwin Nunes to start and he's just got so much pace and power he'll he'll worry any fullback wouldn't he? So that'll be an interesting battle whoever United line up with. Um, but you know all over the pitch there's going to be little individual battles to to cut the side the game and. It's going to be a fascinating one. It's not going to be um, quite as comfortable as it was in April for Liverpool when they won 4-0. Uh, that was the, the sorriest Manchester United team I think I've ever seen. Um, probably will ever see, in all honesty, they were that bad. Um, but I'm not sure I'm having quite having United as this totally transformed team at the moment. I keep hearing the quadruple. I probably heard the quadruple talk this week more than I ever heard about Liverpool. And, and I wrote it most weeks when Liverpool were going for it. Um and it's been quietly been put to the side that it's only the Europa League as well and it's not the Champions League. But um, I don't think they're going to win the Premier League, are they? They, they maybe could win the Europa League, could win the FA Cup. But um, I 
I don't know whether I'm quite having them as this team transformed at the moment. They've obviously had a really good season, but they were amazing from the doldrums, weren't they, really, with, um, with the Ralph Ranyak era. So, you know, maybe it's a good time for Liverpool to put them back in the box on Sunday. They're 11 points off you're not, uh, for, off Arsenal, for goodness sake, and like six off City. Like, if anyone's top in Arsenal, it's City, because it's what City do. But like, Liverpool have had two seasons where they've lost out on the title by a point. So that they know the danger of Man City in these title races when you get to this end of the season. If any United fan genuinely thinks they're going to topple both of them and finish top, they're deluded. Yes, absolutely. Liverpool are closer to United than United are to, to Arsenal, which probably sums up the uh, the state of the title race. It should should certainly be a, an interesting battle on Sunday. So let's move on and pick our teams for that game. I suppose the goalkeeper and the back four, Gorsty, is probably fairly easy to select. There'll be a uh, one change, I would imagine, from midweek, Andy Robertson comes back in. Yeah, spot on. Um, I think it's crucial now for Canate to get a really strong, solid run of games behind them because he's barely played all season, has he? Um, so, yeah, no, 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 the one change for me, Robertson on the left. Yep, absolutely. I'm going to assume that that is the case for, for Kiefer and for Theo as well, but do shout up if it's not. And we'll move on to the uh, the midfield. Theo, I'll come to you first on this one. What do you reckon in the centre of the pitch? Uh, it, it's a difficult one in the midfield because there is an argument that you go for more experience and you put Jordan Henderson in there. You want a, a captain's performance from him, but he's not really finding form the same way Fabinho is. So I'd be tempted to just leave it as it is. I, it was a bold call for Klopp to go for Setichnelli at either side of Fabinho in midweek. And obviously United's a much more daunting prospect than Wolves. But both of them did well. And when you've got five substitutes, if, if it's not working, you can always take one of them off at half-time and throw Henderson on there. But they're playing well. They've got the jerseys, rightly so. And in this season where it's not necessarily gone to plan for Liverpool, you might as well look to the future and those two are going to be Liverpool's future one way or another so I'd leave it as it is but I wouldn't be surprised if he did go for a more experienced head. Yeah I think I'm going to go with Jordan Henderson I think he'll probably come in for Harvey Elliott and that probably is the best balance that we've seen for for a few weeks really I think Stefan Bajetic will definitely be in there which probably sums up his performances key for over the last few weeks is that the same three for, for you or, or any changes among that? No, I've, yeah, I've gone for Fabinho and uh, Besetic keeping their place. And then, you know, obviously no no discredit to Elliot. Obviously had a, a good game the other night, but I think it's just that, that kind of experience. You're up against Casemiro, who's a, what, a five-times Champions League winner. I just think, you know, Henderson's been there. He's done it. He's got the T-shirt. I just think it is a massive game. And, and obviously, you know, Besetic... lost two Champions League finals against Casemiro. Is that the and, T-shirt you want? Well, <laughs> I say you've trumped me there, Theo, but he's, he's certainly got an, enough appearances in his career and enough experiences. And I'm sure, you know, Elliot's time will come. Um, but in, in terms of percentage, as you say, Matt, you know, it kind of just sums up his, his rise over the past six, seven, eight weeks. And, you know, it's it's probably not even his biggest game of the season. Obviously, he's already started against Real Madrid. So there's, there's no reason, you know, why he, I know he was potentially at fault. For, I think, well, not at fault, but he, he could have maybe prevented the, the fourth or fifth goal. Um, but, um, you know, he's, he's certainly kind of held his own in those kind of battles already. So just, there's no reason why why you wouldn't take him out. Um, but as, as I go the other way to what Theo says, I wouldn't be surprised if you went with Elliot and Pesetic at the same time. And that's not me sitting on the fence here. I just think, you know, getting legs around for being obviously clearly has helped him in, in, you know, when we've seen kind of, you know, performances here or there where he's looked like getting back to himself. And I just think, you know, if you kind of get those two and, you know, it depends what approach you go. So I think if he's going to, if, if he wants Liverpool to kind of have the ball and, and kind of make United work for, obviously Henderson will be there. But if he's expecting a, you know, United to come and sit in deep, then he, then he might go for, uh, he might go for, for the two young lads just to kind of get in their faces, bring that energy. And, and as Theo says, you've got five subs. So, you know, it's not exactly detrimental if you, if you need to change one at half time or, you know, bring on that Henderson and his, you know, his, his t shirts that, you know, says to kind of go up against Casemiro. So, yeah, but my first choice will be, I think, I think Henderson on the right. Yeah, Stefan Bajetic, I think, is almost a certainty to start. Gorsty Henderson for you as well, or which way would you be going with it? Yeah, Henderson, uh, Bajetic and uh, Fabinho. No slight on on Elliot at all. I thought he, he played well um, the other night. He's probably the one Liverpool midfielder who's prepared to get into the box, isn't he? We've seen that you know three or four times. Um, on Wednesday, and he's actually got his arm for the for the second goal. He wants that one from Costa Simakas as well. Um, but I just think a little bit more um, solidity, um, 
hard running, you know, all the kind of physical aspects that the Henderson gives you that you kind of accept that Harvey Elliott doesn't give you him. You know, he's a lot more tactical based player, isn't he? So, uh, no, as I say, no slight on him, but Henderson in alongside Stephen Pachet choose just become a Liverpool first team player now, hasn't he? I think. Yeah, arguably the uh, the most informed midfielder that they've got at the moment. I'll stick with you as well, Gorsley, for the, the forward three. I think we probably know two out of the three and then maybe a decision to play uh, either Jota or, or Gakpo through the middle, I'd say. Yeah, I just wonder how much Jota's got in the tank after his, what, what was it, the other night, 70 minutes or so. Um, his first Anfield start since the win over City in mid-October. Obviously started against Palace as well, but it's it's a long time out. Four and a half months um, with that injury, half a season really, isn't it? And then you're adding the fact that he had that hamstring injury from July to September as well. So um, maybe Cody Gakpo for this one. Yeah, I think that as well. I think it'll be uh, Gakpo through the centre. Nunes left, Salah right. Are you the same, Theo? Or any argument for for Jota or or even for Firmino? No, I, I'm going with that as well. Uh, like Gorsty said, I think it's a long time out for Jota, and he's had two starts here. Um, he was bright in spells against Wolves. It was uh, his fast, uh, quick thinking that set up Van Dijk's opener, and it was a, a great one run from him into the box for the disallowed goal. But you, you want it will take a while for him to get back to his best. Uh, I know injuries make up a lot of it, but he's still not scored for eleven months. You don't want to rush him back too much and then risk him breaking down again. I think um, Van Dijk's. Was it with Gorsty in the mix zone where he said about playing too much after coming back from a, a long-term injury and how that's cost him heading into the World Cup? Now, obviously, Jota's injury wasn't as serious as Van Dijk's, but manage him carefully. When you've got the options there, so you can make these changes, make the changes. And Gakpo, he, he did well enough when he came on in week. He gets the start in place back. Yeah, Gakpo for you as, as well, Kiefer? Yeah, absolutely. Just to kind of echo what, what both lads have, have already said there, I think. I think also as well, it's worth remembering Gakpo has probably played far more than anyone would have expected at this kind of stage of his, of his Liverpool career. So, you know, it's not exactly like he's a, a typical January signing who's maybe had the odd appearance there and, you know, in ideal circumstances would have probably been better in a lot slower than he has. So I see I see no reason, you know, why not to start him. And he, he's showed good signs, a good link up with, with Salah and Nunes so far. And, and, you know, I know Jota hasn't scored since, since last April, was it? But, um, you know, he's not a bad option to have off the bench if you need, a, you know, someone to kind of just a bit of impetus in the final, you know, 25, 30 minutes. So, yeah, that'll, that'll be my starting three as well. Yeah, I think that's probably the way that Jurgen Klopp will go. Let's finish then with some match predictions. I'm going to go for a Liverpool win. I'm going to go 2-1. Gorsty, what do you reckon? I don't think a draw is a, a, a too bad a result for Liverpool, really, um, given that they've still got to play the likes of, you know, Arsenal and, sorry, Chelsea and, and Tottenham. Uh, so, it, it, yeah, I'll go with the draw. Two all draw. Theo, uh, I'm going to go two one Liverpool as well, just because I'm, I'm picturing the scene where the narrative is Gakpo scores against the side that could have signed him, Nuno scores against the side that could have signed him. That amuses me. So I'll go for both of them scoring in a two one. Good stuff. Certainly take that, Kiefer, to finish us off. Closely contested one 0 Liverpool season back on track. Another clean sheath as well. I'd certainly, certainly take that. But we shall see what happens. Another massive game, of course, for the Reds. We'll have all of the coverage across the Liverpool Echo and Liverpool.com as well. So do make sure you're checking out all of those bits. For now, though, we shall leave it there. Thank you very much for listening. And we'll catch you next time right here on the Blood Red Channel. <laughs>